Hello, my name is Nick Moser. I'm a software engineer three on clinical reporting. I've been at Cerner for about seven years, and today I'll be doing a talk on reverse engineering. I've been interested in reverse engineering for the last few years, and I've really wanted to do some sort of tech talk about what I've learned. So today, I hope to explain what reverse engineering is and how to do it. Let me start with a scenario we've all had before. You run into a computer problem. Let's say your computer's going slow, and the only explanation is that you have a virus. You go to a website that says, hey, download this thing and run it, and your virus problems will go away. You download it, and right as you're about to run it, you have a thought. Is this program actually a virus? I mean, the program says it's not a virus. I trust that dolphin's face, don't you? What if I told you when you would even need to trust that dolphin? What if I told you there's a way to find out what a program does without even running it? <clears throat> Furthermore, what if I told you there's a way you could even modify this program without having the source code? These things I've just said are possible with the power of reverse engineering. This is the point where I would read the Wikipedia article on reverse engineering, but instead, I'm just going to say that reverse engineering is kind of like the opposite of writing software. Normally with writing software, you write code that compiles to something, like an executable. Reverse engineering is going backwards. You have the finished product, like an executable, and you're trying to figure out what it is and how it works. There are a lot of ways to figure out how it works, and we'll be going over many of those strategies in this talk. A lot of you actually reverse engineer every day at work without realizing it. Anytime you need to fix another team's code, you likely are reverse engineering. You may look at the code itself or what the code outputs, but you are trying to figure out how it works in order to make a change to it. I'm sure many of you even reverse engineer your own team's code. So here's the talk structure. Now, I'm warning everyone in advance. This is an intermediate level talk. If you've never written code before, most of this talk will be very confusing to you. Also, I have a lot of slides and I talk fast. So please consider pausing the talk or rewinding parts you need more time to read. I'll start with some background information. When thinking about reverse engineering, most people think about using it offensively. That is, you're a bad person trying to add malware to something, or you're trying to break into software to do things you're not allowed to do. However, there are many legitimate uses of reverse engineering by developers. One such case I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, you should remain highly skeptical of all software you download online, especially in cases where the software is obscure or unknown. It's even possible that software is shipped with malware that the writer of the software is unaware of. We've seen more supply chain attacks recently as open source code repositories have been hijacked by malicious actors. Speaking of which, another case is to make sure that the code you release is not tampered with. You may have recently heard of the SolarWinds hack, considered one of the worst cyber espionage incidents ever suffered by the United States. The exploit was performed via a supply chain attack on the SolarWinds build system. Malware was injected into the end state during the build process. Imagine that you write some code and release it on Electric Commander, but the Electric Commander build machine is compromised and injects malware into your end state. How would you even know this happened? One way is to compare the final end state to the one you created locally and spot any differences. Oh, and also hope you're not infected locally. Another useful situation is when you have an executable that the source code no longer exists for. Maybe some engineer at Cerner wrote a tool on their machine, released the tool, and have since left Cerner. That source code may be long gone now. You may run into a situation where you need to make changes to the tool. Reverse engineering can help you understand how the tool works so that you can rewrite it. Or you can use reverse engineering to modify the tool itself. There's also a great educational benefit to reverse engineering. You'll learn a lot more about how compilers and interpreters work. You can learn more about assembly, how to read it, and how to write it. Even though we don't interact with assembly much as part of our jobs at Cerner, knowing more about it will make you a better engineer. And last, reverse engineering is fun to do. Throughout this talk, I'll reference both machine code and assembly. Here's a picture of some machine code binary. Each line is a single instruction. Each byte is represented in base 16, also known as hex, to make it more human readable. A CPU can read and execute these bytes. Different CPUs read different types of machine code. This machine code in particular is for the x86 architecture, which is what my computer uses. You can take machine code and make it more human readable by running it through a disassembler, which turns the bytes into assembly instructions. The machine code bytes on the left correlate to the assembly instructions on the right. You'll see machine code and assembly next to each other like this throughout the talk. 
All right, let's talk about the executable formats now. All files on your computer have a file format. Executables are no different. Formats are basically a standard way to encode the bytes in a file so that when your computer reads the bytes, it knows what they mean and what to do with them. On Windows, the most common is the portable executable format. When you run a .exe file, it's probably this. On Linux, the most common is the executable and link format, better known as ELF. When you run a Linux executable, it's probably this. You need to know what executable format you're looking at when reverse engineering, because each format is different. They're similar in a lot of ways, but also very different. Each format has its own metadata and various sections in it. The formats are organized differently, but have a lot of the same sections in common. Let's talk about some of the sections they have in common. Don't worry, we're almost at the fun part. The first section PE and ELF have in common is the .text section, which contains the machine code instructions to be run by the CPU. This is the code inside of the executable that gets run. Another section is the .data section, which stores information for initialized data with read-write access. What that means is if in a programming language you declare a variable with a primitive data type, so for example, int x equals 3, that 3 will probably be stored in the .data section. This section has read and write access, so it can be overridden while the program runs. There's a similar section named slightly differently between PE and ELF called rData in PE and rowData in ELF. If in a programming language you declare a final or constant variable with a primitive data type, so for example, final int x equals 3, that 3 will probably be stored in this section. It does not have write access, so it cannot be overridden while the program runs. It can, however, be modified if we change it in the executable itself, which I'll be showing how to do later. The last section worth mentioning here is the BSS section. This is uninitialized data with read-write access. If in a programming language you declare a variable that is assigned later, or in other words, isn't given an immediate value, it will likely be in this section. This section actually doesn't take up any space in the executable because it's all zeros, but space will be allocated for these variables in memory when the program runs. Okay, enough background, let's start looking at code. We can start by just writing a quick program to use as an example for the next handful of slides. This is a C program that prints out Hello World. Pretty simple. Let's compile it on Windows and run it. Yep, prints out Hello World. I've named it Hello World underscore MSVC. So what about Linux? Yep, also prints out Hello World. I've named this file Hello underscore war world uh, underscore GCC. Okay, cool. So now we have a Windows executable and a Linux executable. Let's look at a few different command line tools to help us reverse engineer these executables. The first command line tool we'll look at is file, which will tell you what file type a file is. It's not available on Windows, but if you have git installed on Windows, you can use it through git bash. Let's go ahead and confirm that our executables are PE for Windows and L for Linux. So for Windows, I've used the file command in git bash on our executable. And as we can see, it is in fact a PE executable. And for Linux now, I can confirm that it is an ELF executable. It's a good idea to confirm this before we start digging into these files, because remember, we're going to be reading and writing data in accordance with these formats. Strings is a useful command line tool you can run that will try and find all strings in a file, whether that file is a text file or not. This is useful because we have binary files, but with text in them. This is one of the first tools a hacker will use because strings in an executable reveal a lot about what an executable does and how it works. Now, strings is on Windows, but you have to download it from Microsoft's website to use it. So here I've downloaded it and ran it on our Windows executable. First, it prints out a DOS mode message. Then it prints out a bunch of text with 92 and 9R. These, are almost, these almost certainly aren't actual strings, but the strings program thought it could be printed, uh, it thought it could be strings, and so printed it out anyways. In other words, they're false positives. But about halfway down, you'll see the names of PE sections like .text and .rdata. And there near the bottom, we see our hello world. So what about on Linux now? And notice that it's a lot different than Windows. This is because the different compilers insert different auto-generated strings into the executables. We do see hello world in there as well, though. This next tool is Linux only. Read elf allows you to display a lot of useful information about an elf file. 
If you run it with the argument dash dash sections, it will list out all the sections and where you can find them in your file. There at number 16, we can see our familiar dot text section and dot row data at 18. But there's a lot of other sections as well that we didn't cover. Let's see how this information is useful if we're looking for a specific section to read or modify. Here I've used readelf again, using the argument dash dash symbols to read the symbol table of the executable. The symbol table stores variable names, function names, objects, classes, interfaces, etc. It's a treasure trove of useful information about the executable. And it's actually a lot longer than I'm showing here, but I cut it down to one of the more interesting parts of it. The symbol table is also not required to be included in an executable. This information can be stripped, so you won't always have it. If you remember that we named our function main, we can actually see the entry for it. It's number 61. We can see where the instructions for it is in the file if we wish to read or modify it. The last command line tool I'll show is object dump, which is another Linux only tool. If you run object dump with the dash D argument, it will print out the machine code and respective assembly instructions for an executable. I've once again cut out portions of it to make it easier to read. So here's a function named underscore start. I don't remember writing that function. Well, that's because it was auto-generated. A lot of auto-generated initialization code is run before your code is even touched. And underscore start is the entry point for a C or C++ program. For more information on that function, I recommend reading an article online called A General Overview of What Happens Before Main. Here's the machine code and assembly for underscore start. And here's the machine code and assembly for our main function. Now, if, you, if you're experienced with reading assembly, you could just read the entire executable with just object dump and find your way around it. So now that we have these tools, let's use them to modify our, our, our executable. Let's say I want to change hello world to something else, like adios world. First, we ran the strings tool and can verify that hello world is stored in the executable itself. If you remember what I said earlier, the dot row data section is where initialized constant data is stored. There's a good chance that's where our string is stored at. So I run read elf and see that the row data section starts at offset 2000 in hex. Then I open the executable in a hex editor, which allows us to read and modify the raw bytes of the executable. This part of the hex editor shows us the binary data in hex. I went ahead and jumped to offset 2000. On the right is the hex editor's attempt to decode the bytes into Windows ANSI text. Here in the row data section, I can see hello world, and I've highlighted the bytes for it. Both the bytes and the decoded text are highlighted together, so you know what bytes correlate to what text. We can quite easily change the hello world text, save it, and run the executable. So here I've modified it from hello world to adios world. You'll see the red bytes on the left, meaning that these bytes have been modified. On the right, you'll see that it now says adios in the decoded text. When I run the executable, we see our new string, adios world. I can do the same thing with the Windows executable. So in this case, we modified a string, which isn't too difficult. What if we wanted to modify the actual machine code and not just initialize data? We could do that by running object dump to read the assembly, finding where that assembly is stored, writing our own assembly, converting that assembly to bytes, and inserting it with a hex editor. Honestly, though, that's complicated and tedious. Surely there exist tools to make these modifications easier. And these tools do exist. Several programs out there market themselves as all-in-one reverse engineering toolboxes. The most popular historically has been IDA Pro, which a license for costs anywhere from hundreds to thousands of dollars, depending on the license type. On top of providing shortcuts for tools we've gone over, many of these toolboxes are able to disassemble and decompile. Disassembling is generating assembly from machine code. That's what object jump does. Decompiling, on the other hand, is recreating the source code from machine code. The source code likely won't be exactly what we wrote, but it may be a pretty good guess. Thankfully, a new free and open source alternative to IDA Pro was released in 2019, making reverse engineering and decompilation much more accessible. This software goes by the name Ghidra. Gidger was declassified and released by the National Security Agency, also known as the NSA, in 2019. It was released for free under the Apache Open Source License. It was the release of Gidra that first got me interested in reverse engineering. 
The fact that such a powerful tool was released for free was really appealing to me, especially so once I saw what it was capable of. So let's go ahead and try it out. So here I've opened Ghidra and created a new project called DevCon. I've also imported my executables into the project. Let's try and open Hello World GCC by double clicking on it. Upon opening an executable for the first time, Ghidra will, Ghidra will want to perform auto analysis of it. I recommend leaving the defaults. If you're curious about any of the options in particular, Ghidra has de uh, great de documentation for each of them. After the auto, auto analysis is done, we now have a code browser IDE open. Let's see what we have available to us. Over here on the left, you can see the program tree. Let's take a closer look at that. We can see that this pane contains a bunch of sections, many familiar to us, like the BSS, data, and text sections. We can double click on any of these sections and Gidra will jump straight to them in the executable. Let's click on the text section. It immediately jumps to the beginning of the text section. You'll see the middle pane and the pane on the right have changed. The middle pane has jumped to what looks like the underscore start function. Here are the references to this function in the executable. This allows us to see other code locations that this function is called by or referred to. Below that, here we see the assembly and machine code for this function. And here on the right, we can see Gidra's attempt at recreating the C code of this machine code. Let's take a closer look at this function. So what do we have here exactly? Well, the function definition says void underscore start, and then has three parameters of type undefined. When Gidra can't ascertain the type of a variable, it simply lists it as undefined. So here we are now inside of the function. We declare two variables that are undefined and have stack in the name. So apparently they have some relation to the stack. Below those two variables is a call to a function called libc start main. Now remember, we didn't write any of this code. This is generated by the compiler. And since it is generated by the compiler, we can actually look up what this function does online. So here I have the documentation for libc start main. It says that it's the initialization routine. It also helpfully lists the parameters. What I'm interested in is that first parameter, which is apparently a pointer to main. If you look back above at the code, we can see that the first parameter we pass into libc start main is in fact main. Now Gidra knows that this is named main, and that's because we have a symbol table in our executable. If someone had stripped the symbol table, Gidra may not realize this is main, but we could ascertain it being main since we have the official documentation of this function. So let's try double clicking on main and see what happens. And now we can see that we've jumped to the main function. This is the code we actually wrote. Here we can see a recreation of the original source code. Something odd is that it's calling puts, not printf. Our code was using printf to say hello world. Well, that turns out to be a compiler optimization. It's important to realize you are almost certainly not looking at the exact same source code. Compiler optimizations and just the lossy nature of decompilation will almost certainly change the code to some extent. Now, remember, the references to this function can also be seen in the middle pane. If we wanted to jump back to the underscore start function, all we need to do is click on reference here and it'll send us directly back to where it passes main into libc start main. Furthermore, we can see the symbol in this pane on the left. Let's take a closer look at this pane. The symbol tree contains a list of all the symbols in the executable. Our function main is in this list. We could have jumped straight to the main function by just clicking on this. The symbol tree also supports, um, the, the symbol tree also supports uh, imports, exports, labels, classes, and namespaces. So it's a great reference for making your way around the executable. So what we've done so far is follow the code flow to see what this program does. Now, obviously our program is simple, so we can figure it out pretty easily. But with a large code base, you'll need to jump into many different functions to understand the flow of code. Let's now take a look at the Windows executable and see what differences there are. So here I've opened the Windows executable in Gidra. The first thing I did was double click on the function named entry, as Gidra knows this is the entry point of the executable. If we actually look in this list, there isn't even a function named main. We're going to have to go and find it manually, and there's a few ways of doing that. We know our program prints the string hello world. 
Let's use Ghidra's string search functionality to search for it. So in the file menu, I went to search and selected four strings. Here are the strings that populate after searching. A few entries down, you can see our hello world string. We also have those section title strings that we saw earlier when we ran the strings program against the executables. Let's go ahead and double click on hello world, which will jump us to it. We've now jumped to where the string is stored in the executable. Here I've put an arrow pointing at the single function reference to the string. This is almost certainly the main function. No other function should be using this string. Let's double click on that and jump to what should be our main function. All right, we've jumped to a new function. On the right pane, I've put an arrow showing that this function isn't called main. It's called fun followed by some numbers. When Gidger doesn't know the name of a function, it gives it a default name like this. Below that, we can see it passes hello world into another unidentified function. Let's say we don't know anything about this executable and we run it and it prints hello world. We then open it in Ghidra and see this. We can use that information to make a guess that this function called is some sort of print. We could even open the function and check for sure. In this case, I'm not gonna bother digging into it. I'll just assume it's printf and that this function is the main function. If I select these functions and press the L key on my keyboard, I can rename them. On the left, I have the original function from Ghidra. And on the right, I have the renamed version. When you're using Ghidra, it is likely that very few functions and variables will have names. Additionally, we've seen that many variables don't even have a data type. Decompilation is a slow process where you try and understand what's happening and document it. You'll add names that may not be correct, but it'll be the best approximation you have with the information you're given. Now, as an additional example, I know that main returns an int. I have it as undefined for there. I could have also um, changed that data type to an int as well. What if our main function in the Windows executable doesn't call hello world? How else could we find it? Well, here I jump to the location in code where main is called from. We can see that it is called on line 65 of the entry function we were looking at earlier. The lines above it are defining variables for argv and argc, the arguments of this program. These arguments are then passed into the main function. Even if we hadn't already named our main function, we would reasonably guess that this is the main function. Now, let's talk about how to do modifications to ex executables from within Ghidra. Let's try changing the hello world string again. First, I searched for and found the hello world string again and jumped to it. Then I've gone to window and I'm selecting the bytes window. This is a window that shows the raw bytes of this file and allows us to modify it. This will open a new window on the right pane, basically a hex editor for us to make changes. We'll also want to hit this button up here to turn on edit mode. So let's just keep things simple and make this string a bunch of the letter H's. We can see that the first byte is 48, so we know 48 is H. I'll just add a bunch of 48s. On the right, you can see the bytes I added are in red. This shows that these bytes have changed. In the center pane next to this arrow, you can see that the string has changed the H's now. Let's now click on File at the top and select Export Program. So when the export window pops up, select the binary format as we want to export a binary executable. I went ahead and gave it a new name with a two at the end so that we don't override our existing executable. And so I saved the new executable, ran it, and as we can see, it printed a bunch of H's. Let's now try and make an actual change to the machine code. Let's try and prevent Hello World from ever being printed entirely. And we'll do this with Ghidra's ability to patch instructions. Let's start by navigating to the first instruction in our main function. I can right click on it and select patch instruction. This will allow us to insert new assembly code in place of this instruction. So on the top image, we have our original instruction, a push. On the bottom image, I've modified, it to I've modified it to a return instruction. There are multiple ways to do a return in x86 assembly, such as a near return versus a far return. So it suggests multiple byte combinations to accomplish that. I'll do C3, which is a near return. Then I hit enter to apply the new instruction. Finally, I save and export the binary like we did before. I'll name the new binary hello world msvc3. Once again, I ran the new executable and operation no hello world was a success. So we've spent quite a bit of time talking about how to make simple changes to executables. 
What if we wanted to make big changes, like adding a lot of new code? Well, if you remember what I said earlier, you can't make the file larger or it'll break. We'll need to find some existing location in our executable to add the code. One way of doing this is utilizing code caves. A code cave is empty space in an executable we could inject code into. Here's an example of what that looks like. On the left side of this image, we see that the green box is code and that the blue box is some empty space after it. This empty space is what we want to take advantage of. On the right, you'll see that we jump from the code cave from the code to the code cave and return back to the code when done. This article, PE and Elf Code Caves by Will Ryan, is a very useful source for finding and using code caves. I have a different idea for injecting our code though. What if instead of using a code cave, we just overwrite existing code? Here's a new program that I wrote. Don't worry about trying to read it that closely. I'll explain what it does. It's a simple calculator that lets you either add or subtract two numbers. When you run it, you pass in three numbers. The first number says to add if it's one and subtract if it's any other number. The other two numbers you provide are then added together or subtracted. The important thing to realize here is that the function named add is only called when you are running the program in adding mode. And the function named subtract is only called when you are running the program in subtraction mode. When you run this program, only one of these two functions is being used. So if we want to insert new code to the add function, we could overwrite the subtract function and branch to it from the add function. Let me show an example of that. So I've compiled this program and opened it in Ghidra. On the left, we have the assembly for our add function. And on the right, we have the assembly for our subtract function. Here's what I want to do. In the subtract function, I'm going to put my own code in this and overwrite the ability to subtract. Then I'm going to branch to, I'm going to branch from the add function to my new subtract function. So here's where the add function actually adds. I'm going to put my branch here so that I don't break the rest of the add function. I'll branch from here to the beginning of the subtract function. If you look at the last two instructions of both functions, it's a pop and then a return. Since both of these functions end with the same two instructions, we don't even need to branch back to add. We can have subtract end the logic and return to main. In other words, everything in subtract from here on up to the top, we can modify and should modify so that the assembly is still valid. That gives us 20 bytes of instructions where we basically can do whatever we want. Now, 20 bytes isn't a lot, but if we extrapolate what we've learned here, you can find dead or uncalled code in an executable and rewrite it with whatever you're wanting to do. So let's finish out this example. On the left, we have our add function still. Here, I've replaced the add instruction with a jump. As you can see, it's jumping or branching rather to subtract. Here on the right, we have our new subtract function. I took out all of the existing instructions and replaced them with a NOP. A NOP is a no operation. It basically tells the CPU to do nothing and keep going. This block of code effectively does nothing and is a canvas for any changes we want to make to it. This is actually called a NOP slide because the, the program counter just slides down the NOPs and does nothing until it eventually hits an instruction where it does do something. As a curiosity, let's just try running this executable with our change. Remember, we put a jump where the add was. So now we are no longer adding. Here's the original version of the calculator before I made my changes. Let me go over how it works. The first number is the mode of the calculator to use. We're using addition, which is set to one. The second and third numbers are the numbers we want to add. Two plus three is five. So what does it print out? Five. Um, so we know that it works at least. Any mode other than one is subtraction. So in the second example, I set the first number to two. So it, sub so it subtracts. We can confirm that two minus three is negative one. So the calculator seems to work well enough. What happens after I make my changes? So here I've run the new version of the calculator and told it to add two and three together. But remember, we removed the adding functionality. So now it just is 20 bytes of nothing. Wait, but it's printing out three for some reason. Well, if we remember the source code, it adds the numbers and prints them. We never removed the printing. We just removed the adding part. So it loads two numbers to add them, but then never actually adds them. And it turns out that the number returned for printing is just the second number. So that's funny, I guess. 
Let's see what happens if we do subtraction. It's probably going to blow up though because we mangled that subtraction function pretty badly. So when we subtract, we get segmentation fault. So yeah, it blew up. Okay, well, we still have 20 bytes to play with. Let's try making something interesting. How about we make a calculator that is sometimes wrong? What if one in every 100 times you use it, it gives the wrong result? So the plan is, first, we add like normal. Then we grab a random number. If that random number divides evenly by 128, then we add 1 to the sum. That gives it a 1 in 128 chance of happening. I went with 128 since it requires less assembly to divide by 128 for computer science reasons. Oh, and we need to do this in 20 bytes. So here's what I ended up doing. First, we grab a random number with the already rand instruction, which takes three bytes. Then we have some instructions to see if it divides evenly by 128. This takes seven bytes to do. This add instruction is only called if we didn't branch above. So this will only be hit one in 128 times. Then last, we run the rest of the code as normal. If you look above this, there's still five knops. So we actually managed to do this in only 15 bytes. We can even see Gidra's attempt to decompile this code to C, which is interesting since we wrote it in assembly. So I ran the new calculator a bunch and tried adding two and three together. Most of the time, it printed five. Oh, hey, but look at that. One time it printed six. Isn't that fun? Also, in completely unrelated news, if any of your coworkers offer you a fun new calculator to try in the coming days, I recommend ignoring them. Fun fact, if you've ever used a cheating device for video games like a Game Genie, Game Shark, or Action Replay, you've done something like what we've done today. These cheat devices allow you to patch game executables to do things like give you more lives or make a game easier in some way. The codes you use for these devices, in many cases, just insert new machine code like we did. So as of the recording of this talk, Gidra 10.0 came out a few weeks ago. With Gidra 10.0 came a highly anticipated new feature. Gidra is now able to debug actively running applications on Windows and Linux. It uses WinDebug on Windows and GDB on Linux. It's able to set breakpoints in the decompiled code, step through it, and even capture memory and register values over time. I have yet to get it set up and working, but from what I've heard, it seems to work well. Having this tool available will almost certainly make it easier to reverse engineer executables. So we're nearly at the end now, and I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about reverse engineering Java and C Sharp, since they're so prevalent at Cerner. Gitra has support for decompiling Java, but I actually don't recommend it. It's not as fleshed out um, as, as Gidra's native executable decompiler. Here's a few alternatives for Java. If you use IntelliJ, you've likely already used IntelliJ's decompiler. If you open a class file without provided source code, IntelliJ can decompile it and show a close approximation of the sources. Eclipse also has a decompiler, but you'll need to download a plugin for it. If you want to decompile a class file without an IDE, you can download a separate program to do so as well, like JD GUI. Decompiling Java is actually quite nice, since you'll usually get variable and method names documented. It's a lot cleaner than decompiling C and C++ native executables. Java end states that are distributed are generally containers. A jar is a zip file container of class files. A war or ear is a zip file container of jars. You can open these files with software like 7-zip or WinRAR, allowing you to see the class files contained in it. Furthermore, software like 7-zip allows you to add or delete the contents. So one thing you can do to patch a jar is delete an existing class from the jar and add a modified class in its place. There are three ways I found to modify a class file. You can use a decompiler to get the source code of the class file, then create a local project with this decompiled source code and recompile it to get a new class file. You can also directly modify the class file with a hex editor. This is similar to the direct modifications we did earlier to our executables. As was the case with executables, this can work well if you're just modifying a string or just one instruction, but does require understanding the full class format in order to make any sort of large changes. There's also tools to make modifying class files easier. One such tool is Krakatau, which can convert class files to a human-readable text format. Then you can modify the human-readable text format, which Krakatau can convert back to a class file. 
I've included an example of this human readable format on the slide. Now, I don't have a lot of experience with C-sharp and reverse engineering C-sharp, but when I have, DNSpy has been the best software for it by far. It allows you to decompile C-sharp code and even run it in debug mode with the breakpoints and stepping. Unfortunately, in December uh, 2020, it was mysteriously set to archived and the owner disappeared. With that being said, there are a few different forks now, so the project isn't dead, but it's definitely in a weird state. Here's an example of me loading a C-sharp app owned by my team in DNSpy. Like Java, met methods and variables are named by default unless it has intentionally been obfuscated. Furthermore, we can run the app in debug mode from DNSpy and set breakpoints. Here I set a breakpoint in the main method, and it stops as expected. The craziest thing is that you can even edit this decompiled source code, and it will recompile it for you within DNSpy. So yeah, it's pretty powerful. So we're almost at the end of this talk. Let's talk about some caveats that make reverse engineering more difficult. Some software is composed of multiple files. This means reverse engineering may not be as simple as throwing an executable into Ghidra. You may need to throw a lot of files in the Ghidra, and even then it may be hard to figure out which file is the code you're looking for. Some software receives instructions from the internet. This means that instead of being able to analyze the entire executable, you can only see how it interacts with the server and what it does with that. This is also how a lot of malware works. You have an executable that goes to a server known as a command and control server and asks it what to do. The command and control server, which is run by the hackers, then can have it do evil stuff like downloading files or running programs. Some software uses obfuscation to hide how it works. Obfuscation is when you deliberately write code that is difficult for humans to understand or you run some program to obfuscate it for you. One such way to obfuscate is to throw a bunch of useless code into your executable. It makes it a lot harder to understand what's happening, what code is actually used, and what code you can ignore as you're going through it. Here's a fun example of code obfuscation. This person wrote the same program I did earlier, printing Hello World, but they used multiplication to do it. Reverse engineering code like this is gonna take a lot more time. I'll end this talk with a few legal notices. First, reverse engineering is legally risky. The key word here is risky. It's not legal in all cases, and it's not illegal in all cases. It really depends on what you're doing and how you do it. Unfortunately, there isn't a clear-cut list of what you can and can't do. There's certainly things, though, that can help or hurt your case, and in that respect, it's kind of like fair use. The safest thing you can do is only reverse engineer software you wrote yourself. And even then, that's not a guarantee to be completely safe. With that being said, all the examples I provided today were me reverse engineering software I wrote or my team here at Cerner wrote. Based on the things I said in the previous slide, it should be clear that if you're ever going to reverse engineer on behalf of Cerner, make sure you have clear permission to do so. Realistically, that should be from your manager and the Cerner legal team. If you're reverse engineering for yourself, however, you may not have the luxury of a lawyer on retainer. In that case, the Electronic Frontier Foundation has provided a list of things you can do to lessen your legal risk and liability. And most important of all, this is not legal advice. I am not a lawyer, and I am especially not your lawyer. I've never practiced law, and I have no intention of ever doing so. Oh, and one last warning. Please do not attempt to reverse engineer malware unless you really know what you're doing. Most professionals who reverse engineer malware do so in a secure environment where there's no chance of the malware causing damage. Many of the professionals have even documented their efforts to reverse engineer such malware. If this sounds interesting to you, I recommend looking up the user Stack Smashing on YouTube. They have a video I really like where they decompile and document the malware WannaCry. Here's a list of materials I've referenced during this talk. I'll post each of these links in the chat at the start and end of this talk so you don't need to scramble to write them down. And that ends my presentation. Thank you all for sitting in to listen today and happy hacking.